Welcome to lesson number eight in our series entitled, Let's Take Another Look, as we look at passages on the life of Jesus. As you may be able to tell from the sound and from the look of the video today, and maybe even from my dog who may, be, who may make an appearance uh, behind me occasionally, I'm recording on the patio outside. It's a beautiful day at this time that I'm doing this. It's just the second day of spring in the year 2023 for those who may be watching this much later and it's just a beautiful day so uh, hope to do a little more recording uh, outside uh, as we look at the this passage today or these two passages we're going to be looking at the healing of Bartimaeus who was blind and then the raising of Lazarus from the dead as we look uh, at two just two of the healing and restoring miracles of Jesus now, miracles, by definition, are events that take place outside of the natural laws of God. They're supernatural. That's what that means, supernatural. They're beyond the basic laws of nature. Um, and, and it's a divine acts by which God acts in a way that contravenes or supersedes the basic laws of nature that God set up which govern our uh, all creation, which govern our universe. Uh, now, we use that word miracle to, uh, in a variety of ways sometimes. I've heard people talk about the miracle of childbirth. Or they'll say, they, you know, doctors have come out or researchers have come out with this miraculous new cancer drug. And granted, those things are wonderful and they are amazing. But they're not really miracles. They are part of or maybe developments of and advancements of in our understanding of how God set up this world, maybe in the example of a drug, or it's a wondrous and amazing thing uh, to the, the birth of children. But it's part of the way that God set up nature to work. Uh, in these things, what we see is Jesus using his divine power to uh, supersede and to counteract um, uh, what has been a, something that's been part of a natural process or a natural consequence in the laws of this world. Now, I picked the healing of Bartimaeus and the raising of Lazarus um, uh, partly because I find them interesting. Uh, I, I like the story of Bartimaeus. It's uh, found in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not in John, but in all three of the what we call the synoptic gospels. Um, and uh, and the raising of Lazarus has always been interesting to me, not only because it's the only one where we have a full raising of the dead, somebody who's believed to be fully, fully dead, uh, but, but also because Mary and Martha and Lazarus are mentioned a couple of other times in Scripture, and it's clear that there was a personal friendship as well as that understanding or belief in who Jesus is. The other interesting thing about uh, these stories is that these healing accounts is that in the gospel of mark um, this is the last event that is recorded before jesus enters into jerusalem on that palm sunday before what we call that holy week or, or he enters into that time of passion <coughs> excuse me with the raising of lazarus it is after the raising of lazarus and the reporting and i'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute in a little bit but but after that is when you have a plot to kill Jesus, there's a plot to kill Lazarus, and it is clear that events are then set in motion following the healing of La the raising of Lazarus, whereby they think we've got to eliminate this guy. And so I think that's very important as well because these in some ways kind of preface or presage the, uh, uh, the, the, the passion and what is eventually going to happen to uh, Jesus. So let's look then first at Bartimaeus, which is found in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. They came to Jericho, and as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many, many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. 
Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Now, as I mentioned, this healing is recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels. Synoptic meaning the synopsis. It's that orderly kind of chronological account that we have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You know, John looks at things a little bit differently. But Mark is the only one to give us a name to this blind beggar. Although even with that, he doesn't give us really a formal name in the same way that we would think of it because uh, that, that prefix bar in Aramaic means son of, and so he was the son of Timaeus. So really what Mark says was uh, that his name was son of Timaeus, son of Timaeus. But at least we're given some sort of, of indication and some sort of naming of this blind beggar. Jesus and the disciples are going, uh, are going through Jericho. They're literally just passing through, and it says a large crowd is there with them. Uh, again, they are on their way to the Passover. He's on his way to the Passover. He's on his way. Jesus is on his way to the cross. But, of course, he's not alone. He's being followed by a large crowd. And that large crowd would have been not only maybe those that were following Jesus now as he's headed to Jerusalem for this time of Passover. And remember, some of them are wondering. They don't know if he's maybe the Messiah. They don't know if maybe he's just a special teacher. But the Passover was a high holy time of the year. We'll talk more about that next week next lesson but uh, but but in this they they want to follow him and see what's going to happen but it would have been not only people who were following jesus or were in that crowd with jesus at this time of the year as the passover was beginning the streets you know the the, the roads on the way would have been crowded all the way because you would have had a regular people and you would have scribes and priests and pharisees that were all headed to jerusalem for the Passover, because you went to the Passover if you were able to do so. And they even estimate that maybe there were as many as, as uh, I've heard estimates anywhere from one to two million people in Jerusalem during this time because of how important it was it being one of the central events in, in Judaism. And so these, these rabbis and these teachers and maybe these that w- would go, as they went along the way, they would kind of walk and they would talk and they would teach and the crowd would listen to them. And uh, uh, and the other thing that's that that provides some context about about where Jesus is and what has taken place before, and I've already talked about what's going to take place after that with the triumphal entry. In the verses leading up to this encounter with Bartimaeus, we have the story of Jesus welcoming the children. Remember, the disciples are trying to keep the children away. The children aren't as important. Uh, aren't very important in their eyes. And Jesus says no uh, and welcomes them. And says, well, welcomes a child and in, in welcomes me. And so what we see is an, an instance where you have uh, those, somebody or a group who are dis, uh, uh, disregarded and not valued by society, but highly valued by Jesus. He then encounters the rich young man, somebody who would have been greatly valued by society, But remember, Jesus says that in order to be his follower, this rich man has to sell everything he has and come follow him because it's that that wealth that's holding him back and what his true allegiance is. And so we have a little bit of reversal already between who is important in society and who is important to Jesus. We also have this request of James and John, two of Jesus' closest disciples, who make this request to sit at the right hand when when Jesus comes into that authority, that that full uh, authority, one to sit on his right and one on his left. In other words, Jesus, make us your second in command. And that's the occasion that Jesus uses to, to talk about true servanthood, to say, you know, talk about those who try to exalt themselves will be humbled, those who humble themselves will be exalted. And the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and that we must seek to be servants of all. And so you have these these uh, disruptions or these turning upside down, and then we get to Bartimaeus, this blind man, this beggar, this man who would have be- people would have believed had sinned in order that caused him to go blind. It was believed in that day and time that if you had a malady like that that happened, then somebody had sinned. Maybe um, 
maybe the parents and maybe that person. And we'll look in just a moment at why they probably would have seen Bartimaeus as the sinner. Um, there's nothing for Bartimaeus to do. The only way that Bartimaeus can support himself, can feed himself, is just to rely upon people throwing a few coins his way. And so, so Bartimaeus cries out in this, un, in this belief that, that people's sins cause this direct punishment. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So he's calling for that mercy and, and forgiveness. And, uh, and, and the attitude of the crowd is such that this, this is an inconsequential blind beggar who must have sinned, is not worthy, and is, and is not of enough importance to be even considered by Jesus. There's no reason that Jesus would stop for what he's going, something very important that he's going to. And so they, they not only tell him to be quiet, they sternly order. You hear that? There's that, con- that, that, that condescending attitude and statement like, you know, you're beneath us, and so we are ordering you to, uh, to, to, to be quiet. But I love that Bartimaeus won't have anything to do with that. He cries out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. And of course, after all, what does he have to lose? He's already blind. He's destitute. He has no real life. His life is basically sitting at that gate, at the city gate, hoping that people will will give him enough food where he can eat for that day. He's already an outcast, cast out from other parts of society. So he cries out again. And what he cries out is, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now that term, son of David, was one used for somebody they, that they believed, the people believed, was would be maybe the Messiah, that, that person that would be the person that would come and be that anointed one of God who God would use for a military overthrow of the Roman Empire, but also would imbue some particular powers as well. Um, and so it's clear that he didn't have it all together about who Jesus was, but then again, neither did the disciples and neither did most in the crown. Um, and, um, and it's actually a sign of Bartimaeus's belief in in that there's something different about jesus in that this is the first time in the book of mark that that particular phrase son of david is used and so there you know there are people as it gets near to the end of his ministry there people begin to wonder these types of things um and and so bartimaeus wouldn't have seen jesus as fully human and fully divine in the same way that that we understand that that idea really didn't come into full understanding until until later on but he did recognize that some that jesus was special that there was something different about him that he might be able to heal him and that he might even be the the messiah and so he cries out to to jesus in in the midst of this uh, neither Bartimaeus nor the crowd fully understand who he is, but Bartimaeus has the most important thing, which is faith. There's a quote that I ran across uh, uh, a while back, kind of went, but I couldn't, could never find a, a source for it. It was an anonymous quote. And it said, we must, ask, we must ask people to think about Jesus but we should not expect them to become theologians before they are Christians. And the reason I bring that up in that context is because one of the things that's clear throughout the Gospels is this misunderstanding of who Jesus really is. And yet what we also see is examples of great faithfulness and great faith and trust, and we see this in Bartimaeus. So the crowd's ordering ordering Bartimaeus to be quiet, but Jesus stops and stand still. And he says, call him here. I remember seeing a, a simple statement one time that said that while Jesus might have been busy at times, he was never in a hurry. The way I like to put it is that Jesus never did ministry on the run. And I don't know about you, but you know, that I, can, I can have to confess that there have been times throughout my ministry um, that I have thought I was too busy or there was something that was so urgent and I neglected the, what something I neglected something or someone that really needed me as a, in, instead of um, believing that that urgent thing or that busy thing could could wait um, and so what we see here is again uh, so true to the character and the nature of Jesus 
Jesus isn't, he might be heading there and he's headed to something the most important time of his life and yet he's not in a hurry. He has time for Bartimaeus, so he he stands still. He says, call him here. And, and, And then, of course, the attitude of the crowd is, oh, well, take heart, jump up, come on, let's go see him now. Now he's calling for you, let's go see him. So the attitude of the crowd changes in the midst of that. And I love the reaction of Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus throws his cloak off, he springs up, and some sometimes jump up or whatever, but I, but, but, um, I love what this version says, the New Revised Standard Version. It says, Bartimaeus sprang up. He leapt up like he had springs in his feet. He's so excited, and he came to Jesus. Now, Jesus asked the question, what do you want me to do for you? It's, doesn't it seem kind of like an obvious and, and thus pointless question? We all know, don't you? Jesus knows what Bartimaeus wants him to do. Um, And yet Bartimaeus has to ask. Over the course of my ministry, sometimes with some younger people, but then also uh, with others as well, I've been asked the question, if Jesus really knows what is in our hearts, and he knows what is bothering us, and and what is on our hearts, and and who we we care for, and, and who we're concerned about, why do we really need to pray? God knows all of these things, uh, anyway, why do we need? Why do we need to tell Jesus what we are feeling, if Jesus already knows these things? And 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 the best answer that I have in that is, of course, Jesus knows what is in our hearts. He knows us better than we know ourselves. But we still ask, because in asking the question, we are putting ourselves and submitting ourselves to uh, uh, to the perfect will and the perfect love of God. In sharing our thoughts and feelings, there's something about saying it out loud or acknowledging it on a conscious level in our brains, acknowledging that that God is the one who is in control and not us. When we make our request before God, we are vulnerable before God, and we're recognizing and understanding that God can do those things that we simply cannot do. So Jesus asked the question, what do you want me to do for you? He, Bartimaeus has to ask. And Bartimaeus says, my teacher, let me see again. Now, I've, I've taught this lesson a few different times. I've preached on Bartimaeus on, on several different occasions throughout the years. But in doing some other research, uh, this, this last time in preparing this, this lesson, um, I ran across something I hadn't run across before, and I found it very powerful. The, the phrase translated here as my teacher, that Hebrew word translated here as my teacher, it's Rabboni, or Rabboni, R-A-B-B-O-N-I. It's close to the word rabbi, it sounds close, doesn't it? But it's a stronger term, it's a term of great honor, recognizing the great authority uh, of someone. And in the New Testament, this phrase for Jesus, Rabboni, this word for Jesus, Rabboni, is only used two times. One is here. And those of you who know your Bible well will know that the other is in John chapter 20, verse 16. It's John's account of the resurrection when Mary is there in the garden. And, um, and Jesus, uh, she does not recognize Jesus, thinks he's the gardener. And she asks, do you know where, they have, where they've taken him? And Jesus calls her name and says, Mary. And she turns and in that full recognition says, Rabboni, my teacher, my master. There's something beautiful about that, that that Bartimaeus is expressing that type of faith before the resurrection that Mary expresses after the resurrection. So Bartimaeus doesn't have a full understanding of who he is, but he had the faith that Jesus could heal him. And Jesus does. Jesus says, go, your faith has made you well. Now there's one part, other part, before we move on from this, that, uh, that he says, my teacher, let me see again. The implication is that at some point in his life, Bartimaeus was able to see. He wasn't blind whether that happened early in childhood, whether he was an apprentice and there was an accident, whether it was some sort of a medical disease, some uh, something else that happened along the way, or maybe later on, uh, you know, maybe early adulthood or or things like that. And of course, we, we don't know. But think about that it just adds to the difficulty of Bartimaeus in that he had been able to see at one point, but now could not. He said, I want to see again. I want to be able to see all those things. All the, you know, I'm out here in nature today, and, and I want to be able to see all the beauty 
of creation. I want to be able to see my loved ones. I want to be able to see my friends. I want to be able to work again. I want to be able to go to the temple. So when he says, I want to see again, he's thinking about all those things that he had lost. Not things that he had never had, as horrible as that would have been, but things that he had at one point and, and what he has lost. And so when Jesus says, your faith has made you well, it's not only in the sight comes back immediately. It's not just a sight that comes back. It's a restoration of life. It's a recognition. That it's, it's, he, he's back to have more than just an existence, more than just laying at the gate begging for, uh, for, for food or begging for money to be able to feed himself. He has now a full life ahead of him again. And, and there's something beautiful uh, about, uh, about that. In his gratitude, then, Bartimaeus then joins that crowd and follows Jesus along the way. And, and we know, again, that, that following him along the way is uh, the indication then is that, even though we don't know anything more about him, the indication that he's there throughout that Holy Week and, and around Jesus in that time we can only imagine what he must have thought at the time of the crucifixion and then uh, hearing later about the resurrection of, of Jesus but all these things are possible because of that healing of his blindness so let's move on then uh, oh, oh I'm sorry I had a quote that I wanted to, to read a professor by the name of Lamar Williamson and I like this quote because it, it, it's a several sentences but it kind of wraps it all up into kind of an, uh, an, a neat synopsis he says, Bartimaeus offers a particularly vivid case study of faith. His crying out to Jesus, even with less than a perfect perception of who Jesus is, his persistent refusal to be silenced, his bold and eager response to Jesus' call, mediated through anonymous third parties, his clear focus on the one thing he wanted most in all the world, together with his keen anticipation that Jesus could and would grant it, are the attitudes and actions which Jesus calls faith. The healing of blind Bartimaeus is not simply a vivid story with a moral for Christians. It is a witness to Jesus Christ and a call to follow him. Bartimaeus' encounter with Jesus transformed his life. He would never be the same again. He knew who was responsible for that transformation and he followed Jesus on the way. And whatever it is that ways that Jesus transforms our life, that call is the same for us to experience the transforming power of Jesus Christ, the caring and the love of Jesus Christ, who stands still and pays attention to our needs, and then to follow him uh, along the way. So now we're going to look at uh, the, the raising of Lazarus. I'm going to start reading at John 11, verse 17. I'm going to go through 44, but I will reference uh, kind of what happens in those first 16 verses. Uh, but, but starting with verse 17, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, uh, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. She said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live and whoever lives and believes in me will never die do you believe this she said to him yes lord i believe that you are the messiah the son of god the one coming into the world when she had said this she went back and called her sister mary and told her privately the teacher is calling is here and is calling for you when she heard it she got up quickly and went to him now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews were there with her in the house, calling, consoling her. They saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary saw where Jesus was, when, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said to them, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, there's already a stench, for he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. There are many aspects of, to this story. And one that strikes me is what I said at the beginning to reiterate here, that it seems like Jesus was close with this family, with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Of course, we have the account of Mary and Martha visiting with Jesus when he goes to visit in their home, and, and uh, we have that where, where Mary sits at Jesus' feet. Martha is is going around and, and busily taking care of things. And, and um, I don't know how it is in other parts of, of the country and family reunions and things. I suspect that it's the same everywhere. But I've been I mean, here in the South and grew up in the South. And I can tell you that just about every family reunion, no matter how big or small or whatever it is, um, no matter, you know, there, there are always those that are around taking care of things, getting everything done, others that are sitting around having a great time. And there are always, there's always somebody say, some of you people need to come, need to quit uh, sitting around. Y'all need to come help us uh, get everything ready. Uh, and so we, we identify with that. But then we know that there are other times that, that they're with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And we'll actually, uh, I'll allude to one of those. Um, uh, later on in in this lesson, uh, Mary and Martha pop up at different times in in the Gospels. Uh, they send word in in the verses leading up to this. They send word to Jesus that Lazarus is ill, and they ask Jesus to come. Now the presumption is that maybe they just they're not expecting anything, but it seems like they are, and so presumably they send word because they want Jesus to heal to heal Lazarus uh, and to heal him of his sickness. But he delays in going there, and we're told before this that he only came after he heard that Lazarus had died. Excuse me. So when Lazarus dies, then Jesus goes to see them. Martha and Mary encounter Jesus differently at different times, but they say the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Now, there are two things going on there. I hear it's obviously a statement of faith and their understanding and belief that Jesus could heal them, but I also think there's some scolding. I think there's some deep grief. I think there's that honesty between that Mary and Martha could have with Jesus, and they say to him, Lord, if you'd just come, he wouldn't have died. So I, I think there's some deep grief and, 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 and that, that is going on in the midst of that. It's also clear that they think he's come too late because he's been dead for four days. And the four days is important because one, it's about that time that, that is, as Martha says, a stench starts. Um, you start having some of that real decomposition of the body. It was also believed in that day and time that after three days that, that, that the soul departed the, the, the body, body. And so it's kind of like they were, uh, were fully and completely dead. Uh, one of my favorite movies is uh, is the Princess Bride, and there's this funny scene in there where one of the main characters, Wesley, um, they think he's dead, and they take him to, to Max the Healer, played by uh, uh, Billy Crystal in this kind of great costume. And and Billy Crystal is Max. He, sa he says, mm, he's not fully dead. He's mostly dead, but he's not fully dead, and I think I can save him. And this is kind of what it is. He's not mostly dead. He is fully dead. There's no hope of any sort of resurrection or restoration, or that's what they 
that's what they think. And that's why they say, if you had come, he wouldn't have uh, died. With Martha, Jesus asked the question, they had this inter interchange about the exchange about the resurrection. And, and she says, Lord, I believe in the resurrection in the final day, in the last day. I believe that he will rise again in that day. And she says, but I also believe that you can do something now. And so it's in that part proclamation that Jesus says I am she says I believe the time in, in, in the time of resurrection that he will rise again and Jesus says I am the resurrection I am life and so we have this indication uh, of Jesus kind of hinting and give us a little foreshadowing about what he is uh, going to to do and in response to that, Martha says, I do believe that you are the Messiah. And he says, do you believe I am who I say I am and what I've just told you? And Martha says, you're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. Now, again, she wouldn't have thought about him being fully human and fully divine in the same way we do. But when she calls him the Messiah, the Son of God, that, that is a huge statement. Because remember, they've been waiting for centuries. So she believes he is the anointed one of God sent to, to save them. And so now she's wondering what is going to be next. We then have this little thing where Jesus doesn't go on into uh, in, into Bethany, but he kind of stays out a little bit and, and calls for Mary to come to him. Now, we don't know exactly all the circumstances of that, but at least the way that I read it is that, that Jesus knows when he goes there into Bethany, there's going to be a crowd of people around. There are people there helping her mourn and who are there. Um, and Jesus wants a little bit of maybe, it seems to me that he wants a little bit of time maybe with Mary where just to talk with her. I know I've had um, I've had some uh, friends of mine who, in the last uh, uh, several weeks, uh, two close friends of mine, two of my closest friends, whose parents have died, and went to the visitation and went to the funeral. But there was a point in which, in the midst of all that, uh, that you know, that I said to them, you know, I know you're real busy right now. There's a lot going on. You got a lot of things to take care of, a lot of family considerations. But there'll come a time, and I want us to have a time to sit and talk. I think this is that time of just kind of Jesus wanting to sit and talk with Mary. Of course, he doesn't get to do that because the crowd thinks she's going to the tomb. So they follow her, and they follow her all the way to where uh, Jesus is. And, and then we have uh, what I think is such a powerful uh, passage here that Jesus is moved by, by, the, by the tears and the weeping of Mary and that of the crowd. And he's so moved that he begins to weep. In the King James Version, it, says, it simply says, Jesus wept. Now, most of us know, um, if we, especially if we grew up uh, like I did, where you, where you had Bible drills and those sorts of things, um, that, that John eleven thirty five is the shortest book, in, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. New Revised Standard says Jesus began to weep. But it's the shortest verse in the Bible. But we often don't understand the context. The reason Jesus was weeping was not for Lazarus. I think he knew exactly what he was going to do with Lazarus. It seems pretty clear that's why he waited to come in the first place. It's not for Lazarus. It's because he senses and is so in tune with that, with that, with the grief and the tears expressed by Mary and, and those who are walking with Mary. So even though he knows what's going to happen, he is moved to tears at their grief, at their suffering, at the depth of their loss. And I think it just it tells us something about Jesus, that Jesus is with us in our time of deep grief, in our time of loss, when our time, and, and, and all we can do is, is cry. Jesus cries with us. The God we worship is a God who loves us that much, who sent his only son, who came in the flesh, who, who took on our human frailties and weakness, who came and did divine acts out of care and love, and whose heart is one of such tenderness and compassion and care and love for us that our suffering moves him to tears. We can worship and follow that kind of God that, that cares for us uh, so, so deeply. Well, then you have this other response. And it shows us that human nature hasn't changed much at all. One group of people, some people see Jesus weeping and they go, Oh, look how much Jesus loved Lazarus. He's really sad too. Another group is over there going, they're kind of those naysayers. 
And in our day and time with social media, we have instant response and they're what they call the trolls, the people that send stuff out just to stir up a reaction to make people mad uh, online with things. But notice that the human nature hasn't changed that much. Some are going, oh, look, isn't that something? Jesus cares so much and cared so much for Lazarus. He's weeping too. And the others go, I don't know about that. If he could heal this blind man, why, can, why, why couldn't he come and why didn't he get here in time to heal Lazarus? There are always going to be people who are like that. Um, and we know, but we, you know, although we know the response to that. So those people, we just have to move on. Um, and so Jesus then, Jesus then uh, gets to the tomb. He offers this prayer. And, and I love how he prays out loud. And he says, Lord, thank you for hearing me. And he says, I know you always hear me, but I'm saying that for the benefit of these people. In other words, these people don't quite get it. And they need, they need a sign. They need a visible sign that you're listening to me, even though I know you're always listening to me. And so I'm going to say this for, for their benefit. I thank you, Lord, that you hear me. God, that you hear me. And so then he calls Lazarus to uh, come out. And Lazarus comes out and he says, unbind him and let him go. And what's clear is in that healing and raising of Lazarus, also any of that bodily decomposition that would have started, any of those things uh, are, are done away with. Lazarus is fully restored in body. And, and Jesus says, unbind him, take the cloths off of him and let him go. Now, after this, and I didn't read this part either, but I encourage you to go read uh, the, the verses uh, following this. After Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, there are a couple of responses. And again, human nature hasn't changed. The response of some people is to believe Jesus, is in, in the proclamation about Jesus, to believe him as the Messiah, to follow him, and to pledge to follow him along the way. The response of some others, though, is that they go and tell the priests and the scribes what has happened, what they have seen in this raising of Lazarus. And notice that the the and and then when you read that, um, what happens in response to that is that Caiaphas said is Caiaphas and the others Caiaphas the high priest is worried that there will be uh, maybe that if people start following Jesus and really seeing him as the Messiah, there might be some sort of uprising and revolt, and the Romans are going to put that down. Jesus is a threat to their own authority because what what is the high priest of the Messiah is here? All those all these sorts of things. And so one group, one, some people begin to follow Jesus. Others go tell what they have seen, maybe out of, maybe just out of awe and wonder. And then the response of some of these folks, such as Caiaphas, is we got to get rid of this guy. And what also happens is we have to get rid not only of him. We got to get rid of the evidence. We got to get rid of, of excuse me. We have to get rid of, of Lazarus. Again, the Passover is coming near, and so they are understanding. If the Messiah was going to appear, they believed it would be during the time of the Passover. And so tensions are even higher than at other times of the year. So this is the interchange going back. When we step back and kind of look at an overview and take these two, the healing of Bartimaeus, uh, of Bartimaeus' blindness, and the raising of Lazarus, what we see is a couple of com commonalities that we see. The faith of those who believe. We see the reaction of the crowd, some positive and some negative. But most fundamentally what we see is the divine power of Jesus and the divine caring of Jesus. And that divine power and that divine caring is still active and present in this world uh, today. I don't know and there's no answer and it's one of those I joke about questions that I have that I'm going to ask God when I get up there, you know, 3,572 questions that I'm going to ask God when I get up there. And, and one, one of those will be uh, about why some people were healed and others weren't because I do believe that divine healings take place. But again, they're not something that's common and it's not something that's something that's dependent upon um, God's, uh, God's perfect will and, and understanding. Uh, but regardless of what we're going through, um, and, and I've never been physically healed of some sort of, of malady, some sort of suffering, but I have been, I've experienced healing on many different occasions. When I was going through a time of spiritual crisis or a time of emotional turmoil, a time of deep grief, and in those times I experienced the supernatural divine God who's over and above all, who at the same time was manifest his love in my heart providing what I needed at that particular time. God continues to work that way. We see that in these two 
uh, miracle stories. We see that in the other healings and other miracles he performed. And we see that same caring and power and love of God present today. Thank you for joining me for this lesson. In the next lesson, um, I'm going to skip over the, I'm going to look up, skip past the triumphal entry. We're going to go straight on to the Lord's Supper, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, and up to the time of the arrest of Jesus. Now again, if those of you who are watching this in the next couple of days after I record it and have sent it out to you, um, you know the time frame. For those that may come across this at some time in the future, I'm recording this and doing this along the line. We are, um, today is March 23rd, 2023. Easter is April the 9th. So next week, uh, in the next lesson that I will do, it will be on the Lord's Supper, Garden of Gethsemane, uh, and then his arrest. The next time and 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 going going on into the trial as well uh and then so the next couple of weeks will be from uh the lord's supper through the crucifixion of jesus and then the wednesday after what is easter we'll look at the resurrection so that's kind of the time frame there thank you for joining me thank you again for joining me for this lesson i hope that you'll tune in to the others that are uh here or are on their way thank you god bless you and have a wonderful day